you open up this uh, online lecture um, as a vice dean for education, uh, uh, teaching, and student affairs. Uh, uh, please allow me to to give my opening in in English, but also I'd like to also to have it in Bahasa Indonesia. So I hope uh, you all uh, don't mind that I will be uh, bilingual in English and also uh, Bahasa Indonesia. Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu, teman-teman semua yang sudah menghadiri online lecture atau kuliah online uh, pagi ini. Uh, this morning we are uh, very fortunate and it is a privilege to have uh, a Dr. Meraiche Yongsma. Dr. Meraiche Yongsma uh, come all the way uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, she is a lecturer, she is an associate professor from the uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, I hope I pronounce it uh, correctly. Um, yeah, I think this is a, quite an opportunity for us, uh, especially uh, I would say being academics uh, in higher education, it is really a, a privilege to continuously learning, to continuously studying. And I think this morning, we are uh, very lucky uh, to have uh, Dr. Marijke Jongsma uh, from the Netherlands, from uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen, uh, because I think uh, the topic that she will deliver uh, this morning, today, is uh, I would say uh, very interesting, very useful uh, for both uh, the lecturers and also students. Uh, just to let you know, Marijke, uh, we have uh, students also uh, attending this uh, uh, lecture and also uh, uh, some lecturers. And uh, lecturers and students, not only coming from uh, Universitas Indonesia, but also from uh, other uh, universities outside uh, UI. So, um, yes, I said earlier, this is, uh, uh, you know, a privilege uh, being academics, be it uh, students or, or lecturers to continuously learn and study. And especially uh, this morning, we have a, a guest lecture, uh, uh, Dr. Marijke, uh, I think, um, I don't know whether I should uh, introduce you uh, or you will introduce yourself uh, later on uh, a bit later uh, Marijke. but I welcome if you want to like you know self introduce yourself uh, uh, before you start your your uh, online lecture uh, Bapak Ibu terima kasih sekali lagi sudah menghadiri dan saya pikir ini adalah satu kesempatan yang baik satu kesempatan uh, yang tidak bisa kita uh, Apa, terima begitu saja uh, uh, dalam mungkin uh, sebulan sekali atau uh, tiap semester ini adalah satu momen yang uh, bisa saya katakan tidak biasa dan uh, kita patut uh, bersyukur uh, uh, we need to be grateful uh, for this uh, opportunity uh, this this morning and uh, yeah this is something that we are committed to to do uh, that you know, as a faculty of psychology at Universitas Indonesia, we uh, strive to, or we aim to, you know, to have a session like this, to have a, a lecture like this, not only uh, this one, not only uh, this time, but, you know, definitely we will uh, organize it. Uh, I, I hope we can organize it regularly uh, uh, in, the, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, coming semesters, coming years. And, uh, you know, because uh, as a students, as also uh, uh, lecturer, uh, researchers, we need to uh, keep up. We need to, you know, strive uh, the best uh, in in the work that uh, we do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, I will uh, leave my opening uh, on that uh, note. That you know, uh, we need to keep up. We need to uh, keep. Uh, learning uh, continuously uh, learning and 
thank you uh, Maraiche for your time for your availability and I think most of all because you know basically we are still having a pandemic uh, that you can come uh, you know in person uh, offline to this campus we are really grateful we are really uh, appreciating uh, you know uh, what you have uh, done what you have uh, 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 contributing and by by uh, coming all the way from the Netherlands and, and in person and I think uh, this is something not to be taken for granted because it's, it's still pandemics uh, I think uh, you have been uh, sorting out things uh, and yeah just to 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 be here and to share with us uh, okay Bapak Ibu uh, saya akan akhiri uh, uh, Saya akan akhiri uh, pembukaan saya. Uh, selamat belajar, selamat uh, memanfaatkan waktu yang tidak panjang, cukup pendek, sebaik-baiknya bersama uh, Dr. Uh, Meraiche Yongsma from uh, Radboud University in Neiman. Okay, uh, I think I'll hand over the time and space to Meraiche. Please, Meraiche. Okay, terima kasih. Am I right? We lost your voice. I think we still lost your voice. Okay. Yes. 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 Is it there? Oh, then I was a bit soft. Yeah. I'm very sorry about that. Demakasi Mas Dicky for your kind words. I uh, totally agree with your uh, introduction there. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I think we already had a very fruitful day yesterday, and. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed also by the guests we, uh, we have been receiving from UI in the past, still a lot of PhDs uh, at the Radboud. So, and it's fantastic to work together with, with, with you know, young talent, but also with esteemed colleagues at this university. So, um, and of course it's, it's nice, uh, you know, being two and a half years in the pandemic to finally be back in Indonesia, although, <laughs> Now I'm sitting online lecturing, but from the campus at UI, and it's really nice to be here. Um, so a very short introduction. I'm Rijs Jongsma. I'm an associate professor at Radboud University at the Faculty of Social Science. Um, I'm mostly involved in cognitive neuroscience. So my teaching is mostly at the research master in cognitive neuroscience. And my background is in EEG research um, so electrophysiological neuroimaging. And I think today's talk will be quite challenging. It's very methodological, but the topic was selected, I think, by, by University of Indonesia. So, uh, um, and it is a talk that was inspired by one of my colleagues. And it is about how we should be careful doing statistical analysis on our physiological data. And I'll get back to that. Now, I would really like to invite you to ask questions during the lecture because it is a challenging topic. Yeah. So if you wait till I'm finished, maybe I, I you know, I've lost you halfway the talk. So if I go too fast or if it is not clear, please ask a question. This can be done in English or perhaps Indonesia or Dutch. Uh, and you can use the chat or open your microphone. Yeah, would that be an idea? So I'm going to share my screen now, if that's okay. And I'm also looking at the moderator. Okay, and I think we have a moderator today, which is Manda. Also Hi. welcome and all yes. our guests. Hi, sorry about that. Hello. <laughs> nice to Pagi. meet you. Good morning. Nice to meet you. I've met you. I've met you like ten years ago. I don't know if you saw. <laughs> oh <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> it was that in Nijmegen, right? Or not? Mm. Or here? When, when you here, when you came oh, to, yeah. uh, as a guest lecturer for our students. That was twelve years ago. Oh, 12 years ago. That's right. I, yes. Yeah. I met you 12 years ago. I was one of the lecturers assigned to assist you actually back then. Yes. <laughs> and you've been working in New York where you had your first publication. I was already very impressed at the time. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I will get started with my talk then. And I call it the linearity delusion. And uh, let me explain why I do that. And I also have to give some of the credits to my uh, supervisor that I did my PhD with ages ago, uh, which is Tineke van Rijn. She is recently retired. But a lot of the work that I'll be presenting in this um, lecture actually was done in close collaboration with Tineke van Rijn. Um, let's see, uh, I really like this. Hmm. This is, this seems not to be back. No, I don't like this. My slides are not moving. Ah, there it is. Good, I'm very sorry about that. Okay, actually this, the, um, I, I uh, prepared this talk after a talk of one of my colleagues, Ben Fickner uh, of our department, who started with a presentation in February on Interaction Gate. An Interaction Gate is a uh, journal publication that recently came out and that gives off a very strong warning that we often draw the wrong conclusions when in our statistical analysis, we observe an interaction effect. And he also proposed some ways how to fix it in relatively simple ways. Now, he started with some questions. And actually, I would like to repeat the questions here. So, uh, of course, the credit goes to my colleague, Dan. But it is, I'm, and I'm sure a lot of you who are involved in research recognize these situations. So, who of you regularly tests for interactions? or for moderations or significance. And I think everybody who uses psychological data or observational does do that. Yeah, so, uh, and who of you follows up significant interactions by plotting and interpreting the regression lines? It would be nice to see some hands, but hopefully you also plot your data. And who of you follows up significant interactions with things like simple slopes? or reg regressions of significance or johnson Neyman, or pick a point procedures? Or who of you checks for nonlinear effects? I mean, and this is also within, for example, the SPSS package that you can test for nonlinearity uh, and dependent variable, independent variable associations that might not be linear. Or who of you is, is following up if they do find that there are nonlinear effects? Yeah. So, and I think most of uh, when I also review uh, journal articles, uh, you see that a lot of people only mention like main and interaction effects and stick to that. Now, why is this dangerous? Um, we have here, for example, an observation. You see a scatter plot of two different groups. Now, and if you look at the models, um, what you see is in blue. These are data from an active substance and in red from a control condition or a placebo condition. Um, and what is plotted is an outcome uh, comparing family support uh, and the effect on mental health. So the, the higher the family support, the higher the mental health. And then what is the added effect of a, uh, of a drug, like an active drug? Then you see that actually, the mental health is increasing, but we still see the moderating effect of the family, uh, family support. So I hope you can agree with me that that's what's happening in this picture. However, um, the family support seems to matter less for the active treatment, yeah? Or the effect of treatment is smaller for high family support. So there's an attenuating interaction. Now, if you would just run an SPSS or an ANOVA, yeah, or a, a, a general linear model, what you would find is that you get an interaction effect. Actually, what you will get is what we see here. Like general, general linear models uh, expect uh, or are, have the assumption of linearity. So what they do is they actually plot straight regression lines. So what they find is that they do find an interaction, but they're probing the wrong interaction and you might end up with wrong conclusions. Because if you assume linearity in this case, what you see is that actually in the placebo condition, 
uh, the effect of family support would be end up higher, yeah, with high family support on mental health than in the active drug condition. Now, and if you look at the previous model, you can e actually quite easily say that this is the wrong conclusion because we see an asymptote getting a ceiling effect at pretty much the same level. Now, one way to, to actually do that, I mean, and even if you would do a correlation here, you wouldn't see it, but is to uh, plot your data and use curve fitting procedures or modeling to see which curve uh, describes the observed data best. And we see that here. Yeah? So this is actually an exponential association that we can plot over the data showing the true uh, uh, nature or the true underlying model of this observation. Now, this is actually another paper, and this is one of my favorite papers of the past year. And this is a paper that warns for having too much a priori hypothesis. And I don't know about um, your department, but at our department nowadays, there's a very strong preference of pre-registration, which means that even before you start to collect your data, you are supposed to submit your research proposal with your theoretical model, your hypothesis, the proposed statistical analysis, uh, before you even start collecting the data. Now, why is this important? This is a very important procedure because it prevents us from p-hacking, and p-hacking is the phenomenon that if you collect data without a priori hypothesis or with, uh, without an a priori plan, how to deal with your data, you might just start to focus on accidental uh, um, significant findings. And we know there's always a 5% chance of having a um, uh, spontaneous significant finding and start to uh, capitalize on those, uh, you know, just, 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 just random significant findings. So, and this is why there has been so much pressure to, to pre-register a study and describe all the steps you're going to take even before you start your experiments. It also allows us to uh, publish studies that we don't find any significant findings because we described the study so well before we set off. So there are two advantages about it. It prevents p-hacking and it also allows um, sharing uh, experiments that have no results, which are very often missing from the literature and are also very useful in sharing uh, uh, research data. However, there is a downside to it. And I really love this paper because it actually states that it can also be a liability. So you need to do actually have both kinds of research, a kind of research with a priori hypothesis, but also research that's hypothesis free. And if you look, for example, at uh, especially biological science, a lot of very important discoveries were done via observation and having an open mind without any a priori hypothesis. So the hypothesis is useful to design tests to estimate parameters um, and, and have your a priori hypothesis, but it may become a liability when it prevents us from exploring other aspects of the data yeah, or think out of the box. And it might even lead to a blinding for new ideas. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of attentional um, or, or, yeah, um attentional blindness and that is when you are focusing your attention to a certain object or a certain uh domain you are getting blinded for other things that are interfering and most uh famous is the gorilla experiment and i'm not sure if you ever heard about the gorilla experiment they actually made a a um uh, a version of the gorilla experiment. But in the gorilla experiment, you have two teams of basketball players. Uh, and the participant is asked to closely watch the basketball game 
and count the number of times one team is actually bouncing the ball and passing the ball. Now, halfway the game, somebody dressed up in a gorilla suit is actually walking through the, through the game very slowly halts. And then most people, at least more than half of the people, if you ask them afterwards, if they have seen something weird, they haven't seen this huge gorilla walking through the game, yeah? Because they have been so focused on counting the basketball. There's very nice uh, examples on YouTube where you can see the whole gorilla experiment and you can even try it out, even in a classroom setting. And it's a very good demonstration how we uh, fail to observe very important and striking uh, phenomena if we are too focused in our attention on, on, on an ongoing uh, uh, a priori set tasks. Now they did a, a similar experiment based on data. Yeah, and they had groups of students and they were provided with data. And some of the groups were asked, can you please, you know, uh, uh, first formulate your hypothesis about what you're going to find. And this was actually uh, a fake data set on body mass index. So they've got uh, just the numbers uh, that are on the top left. Yeah. Uh, the number of steps and the body mass index. And then this was separate for males and females. Now, if you would plot the data, you would see the gorilla, which was a nice reference to the gorilla experiment. But as we know, not everybody will plot the data. And if you have a priori hypothesis, people would just run their statistical analysis on the provided data and um, report that there would be either a main effect or an interaction effect. Yeah. Now, if they compared groups of students that uh, were in the condition that they had to formulate a hypothesis uh, beforehand or hypothesis-free groups, then the likelihood of discovering the, the, uh, the gorilla was much higher in the groups that did not formulate a priori hypothesis. Yeah. So this is for me also a very clear demonstration how important it is to always very closely look at collected data, always plot your data, and always think about what model lies behind it to describe your data. Now, one of the problems is that most of our statistical procedures do have the assumption of linear relations. Yeah, so we see that on the right, and they're always based on the fact, you know, if, 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 if one um, if variable increases, it has a linear relation to another variable. The problem is that linear relations hardly exist in real life. And I actually would like to challenge you to provide me of one example yeah, of a true linear relation in relation to human behavior. And I think there cannot be any linear relations because we always deal with ceiling effects and with, with, with floor effects. So, I mean, by, by, by boundaries of having a lowest value and a highest value, a linear relation can never continue to grow or to decrease. Um, so although our statistical procedures are based on linearity, it actually doesn't really exist in real data, but we like linear relationships because there are very powerful predictions and it's very easy to, or easy, it's very straightforward to uh, test for interaction effects, the main effects. But in the, in the final steps, there is a high risk of incorrect interpretation, for example, of interaction effects. Now, some common solutions that are I generally use is, for example, by transforming your data to make them more linear. So um, what we often do, for example, with survey data, obviously, is normalization or z-score transforms or some logarithmic transforms that can uh, transform your data from, for example, an exponential growth uh, towards a more linear uh, uh, equation, yeah, if you plot your data. But that's already tweaking your raw data. Now, I have um, here a nice example 
uh, and this is just um, a theoretical set of data of a training procedure or an intervention study. And this is a repeated measure study <clears throat> where on day one, there is a baseline measurement. On the second uh, data collection, that's for example, one day after training, <clears throat> T3 is actually four days after training. And then data were collected one week, two weeks or three weeks after training. Now, if you plot your data, it seems like a nice linear relation, but if you look at the true timeline between the different moments of data collection, what we see is that the time gaps between the data collection series are not equalized. Yeah? So if you would plot the data uh, using a real x-axis with day one, day two, day four, day seven, and then with day 14 and 21, so after one week and two weeks, yeah, we would actually see that the pattern is quite different than in the left panel. And what we see now is that the linear relation does not really capture the data very well. Now, if we um, replace this with a first order polynomial, so this is a straight line, the function is just y is b yeah, zero plus b1 times x, we get a standard regression analysis. But if we um, replace this with a second order polynomial, yeah, we see that it actually has a much closer fit with the observed data. And we can even continue with a third order polynomial or cubic uh, relation or a fourth order polynomial uh, quadratic equation, which almost describes the data perfectly. So we can keep adding orders to our polynomial associations going from a first order, which is linear regression towards the second order third order or fourth order. However, this is a very mathematical approach, just increasing the orders of your polynomial. And what you could also do is use a less mathematical but more physiological approach. And this is what I like. And actually use your theoretical a priori model to uh, find uh, a mathematical model to describe your data. So we know that in learning or in interventions, that you see in the beginning of your, your training, you see a very steep effect, but continuing the training, the effect will become more and more gradual. Yeah, so it goes towards an asymptote. And we actually know beforehand that we're probably looking at an exponential growth model. Yeah, so uh, an exponential association. So instead using a polynomial, I could also have a look at, um, uh, a more uh, physiological model. Now we can test which model describes the data best by applying an extra sum of squares F test. So this is a very standard procedure. And what the extra sum of squares test does is to measure uh, the distance between observed data and the point on the curve, and then finding the curve with the lowest deviation from the observed data, and then testing if this difference is still significant, but always giving the preference towards the simpler model. Yeah, so you only make your model more complex if it really adds in describing the data better. Um, and this is actually um, what you can do on real observed data. So if I continue now, and I don't know if there's any questions so far, but uh, I'm also looking now at Manda. I think uh, it's still clear, good, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to the first experiment where we applied these data. And that this asks for a little background and this is where I become really enthusiastic because this is my topic. I do a lot of EEG research and a lot of event related potential research. And to first explain what we're looking at here is just traces of the human EEG. So the EEG is basically just wriggling lines. And I presume most people know what an electroencephalogram is. It's when you um, capture um, the electric activity of the brain by using scalp electrodes that are able 
to register very subtle push and pull on the electrode based on, on uh, tiny voltage changes on the cortical surface. Yeah? And this reflects the ongoing brain activity during a task. Now, if we just look at the EEG, it basically looks like, you know, a continuous Wrigley line, and it's very difficult to derive any information from it. But the ERP methodology, and I see something in the chat coming in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you can write it in the chat box. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so if you record the EEG and you present the participants with a cognitive task, what you can do then, if you do a task repeatedly, for example, presenting a meaningful sound, yeah? So if I give a, a beeping sound uh, to a participant and I have a lot of standard beeps, for example, beep, 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 and sometimes I have a target beep like beep, and I tell participants that if they hear the uh, deviant sound that they have to press a button, this deviant sound becomes very meaningful, yeah? because it's task related and they have to tend to it. Now, if I put a marker in the EEG every time I present them with such a target, uh, meaningful sound, and if I average all the EEG responses after that sound, what I end up with is a very specific, yeah. Oh, and clear uh, waveform in the EEG that uh, can be described with different peaks and troughs. So on the left, we have the ongoing EEG with all the repeated meaningful stimuli. And on the right, we have the average surrounding all the meaningful stimuli. And you see that there's only the um, brain electric activity that is in time related to the processing of this meaningful sound remains visible. And this we know is the event-related potential that can be described in several peaks and troughs. And what we can now do is to measure the amplitude of such a very specific peak or trough. So basically this is what I do most of my days is just look at EEG Wrigley lines and try to extract the specific waveform related to either a neuropsychological test or an information processing procedure. Now, there are certain assumptions for the averaging procedure. That is, if you, by averaging, you remove uh, the ongoing EEG that has nothing to do with the processing of the uh, meaningful stimulus. And that there is a specific and quite stable response to this stimulus. And also that the activity related to this process is both time locked to the stimulus, so it is uh, always at the same moment, and also phase locked to uh, the, the presentation of the stimulus. Now, and we can use the ERP methodology to study information processing. Now you're probably all familiar with the information processing theory by George Miller. And that theory actually states that if you present somebody with a stimulus, like we saw in the ERP example, that um, there is first an initial orienting response, there's perception going on. And then we see that there's actually a lot of cognitive processes involved by processing the stimulus and starting to generate a response. So people first have to perceive the stimulus. There's maybe an increase in arousal. People have to direct their attention to the stimulus. Then the stimulus is compared in a working memory um, uh, storage to see if it is indeed a target stimulus or a background stimulus. There might be some emotional responses triggered to it, like I really want to be faster than with the detection of the previous one. There might be expectations involved, long-term memory. And then based on all these checks and balances, people might decide whether or not to generate a response, yeah, to press a button, and then they want to modulate their behavior based on either giving a correct or an incorrect response by providing also some feedback mechanisms. So 
what we do in reaction time research is pretty much presenting stimuli and measuring responses. Yeah, so we get then response times and error rates. But if you combine that with the EEG and the event-related potential methodology, we get a far more refined idea about all the intervening cognitive uh, operations happening between the presentation of the stimulus and the generation of this response. So you can basically treat this as very refined reaction time experiments. Also because it doesn't really give us one dependent variable, but very often several dependent variable. So again, if you look at the event related potential uh, based on a certain stimulus, we can distinguish reactions in the EEG preceding the stimulus, which are preparatory responses. Yeah. So expectancy, for example, we can distinguish the early components that reflect mostly the physical characteristics of the stimulus. So, for example, uh, a loud stimulus would result in higher amplitudes of these exogenous components from being out of the person. And then the later components we know as being the endogenous components that are modulated by different aspects of information processing and uh, have the capacity, I mean, are more generated within the person. So these are uh, modulated by task demands. For example, do I have to generate a response? Is this a target? Uh, do I recognize the stimulus? Yeah. And then we see changes in these endogenous components. Um, now, what's interesting is that one of the most commonly used models in event-related potential research is the oddball paradigm. And that's pretty much the experiment that I described, that you present people with very stable background stimuli, for example, low soft beeps, beep, 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 beep. And then occasionally you present the target stimulus, beep, and you ask the participant to respond to the target. And this is known as the oddball paradigm. So you get beep, 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 et cetera. So it's a very boring experiment, but it gives you a very beautiful data. And it's, there are over 50,000 publications using this uh, paradigm with all different kinds of settings to study event-related potentials. Now, what we know is that in reaction to the background stimuli, we see an event-related potential with a very low P300, as we call it, P300 component, which is a positive peak that arrives uh, about 300 milliseconds after presentation of the stimulus. And we see that this P300 component is increased when we present this deviant target stimulus. Yeah? And it has been associated with target detection and response selection. So every time a participant hears a meaningful stimulus or um, is presented with a stimulus it has to uh, react on, we see a, a very high P300 reaction in the EEG. Now we did a lot of P300 research in our lab as well. And the P300, can be described based on its amplitude in microvolt and based on its latency in milliseconds. And if we capture these two dependent variables for each participant, we can plot these P300 amplitudes and these P300 latencies. Now, what I actually found very funny because we didn't know it, I had a PhD who did a huge P300 meta-analysis uh, to study P300 changes over lifespan. And then another colleague told me that it actually is now in the wiki page on the P300 that they used uh, the data of our paper of the P300 development over lifespan. And not only that, but what I really like about it that if you look carefully at the P300 uh, amplitudes and latencies, you see the curve fitting procedure that I described at the start of my talk that we applied to describe the lifetime changes of the P300. 
Now, what you very nicely see is the upper panel is the P300 latency. And I actually oh, have that enlarged here. So the upper panel here, you see the P300 latency that is quite slow uh, at, uh, uh, during, uh, during uh, childhood, yeah, school ages. So these are, this is age going from six years old to 80 years old. And these are all the P300 latencies. So you become faster and you reach like uh, the highest speed in your early 20s. We know that, yeah. Speed accuracy is almost optimal in people that have just be matured. Uh, and before you get into this upgoing slope again of aging. Uh, and then again, reaction times or, or uh, P300 latencies decrease when you grow older. The opposite we see in the P300 amplitude, we see an increase with age, also with a maximum in the early 20s, and then again, the P300 amplitude decreases with age. So it nicely reflects, and also if you look at the reaction times, they are similar to the P300 latencies, that if you look at brain development during lifespan from the ages of six till 80, there is an optimum and speed accuracy of, of target detection in your early 20s. Now, what we did do to describe the data is we did find that the data could be best described by a logarithmic Gaussian model. We tested it, this against uh, alternative models. And what we also saw was the latency uh, uh, had an optimum of the age of 22 years. And we call this descriptive modeling. Yeah, and I hope you agree with me that if you have a large set of data, you make a scatter plot. This is an approach that you can use to see what kind of statistical model describes my data best. And you can go from there. Now, what you can also do is actually uh, use these data from your model. So this Gaussian model can be described with an amplitude um, uh, or with a, with a center value, a width. So, uh, so you, you want to know what the center value is of your Gaussian, the width of your Gaussian, but also the height of your Gaussian. And you can use these, these um, uh, descriptors of your model as dependent variables to test if this Gaussian model, for example, is the same or different between male and female participants. Does that make sense? So you have this whole data set for male and females. You can describe it with your Gaussian model and you can see if of this Gaussian model, the center values are the same between the groups. The width is the same between the groups or the height is the same between the groups. So we can uh, uh, put our a uh, mathematical descriptive model within a new set of statistical analysis. And then we can compare it, do the best fit values uh, of the selected parameters. So these are your parameters, center width and height. Are they the same or are they different between two groups? Now, what we see here is that we actually found that they did differ between male and females. And this is a combination graph of all the data that we collected. And what's also interesting, because we also looked at uh, the model for the different aspects of the P300 and the reaction times. And we could also test if latency and amplitude uh, followed the same uh, Gaussian model or actually had a different Gaussian model. Now, why is this interesting? It is interesting to know if the dependent variables of the latency and amplitude uh, are dependent or independent measures of the ERP P300 component. And what we did find was that they actually differed in their center uh, parameter and that maturation of the amplitude precedes the maturation of the latency and even further proceeds the maturation of the reaction time yeah, due to compository mechanisms. 
Now, from descriptive to predictive modeling. So, I mean, in the first part of my talk, I have hopefully demonstrated that if you have a large set of data, you can use uh, models to describe your data. So, uh, what is the underlying uh, mechanism that generates these data? Is that a Gaussian? Is that a exponential model? Is that a polynomial, etc., or a cubic spline? But you can also, if you have an idea what kind of model generates your data, the underlying model, you can use that to actually predict data that will be happening. So if you know that your data will be, for example, Gaussian, you can use that for prediction. And I think it has become very um, widely accessible for the general public during the pandemic. And this is where all of a sudden in the media, we were all bombarded with these kind of predictive models. Yeah, and I think everybody has seen this, this picture in the media. And it was at the start of the pandemic when they had to um, educate uh, the population why it is so important to stick to the measures to prevent spreading of the virus. And it is because it's so contagious. So maybe COVID isn't that impressive when it comes to mortality, although we, we have suffered a lot of losses and uh, there's a lot of drama going about. But it's mostly the very high infection rates, yeah, the arm. Now, I think everybody on the street nowadays knows about these kind of models and about the, the, the meaning of the, the R, you know, the, the infectious rate. And uh, there was a very simple explanation. If we don't uh, try to prevent spreading of the virus, we get an incredible wave of infections that will flood the healthcare system. Whereas if we do stick to the measures, we will flatten the curve. And I think this almost became um, uh, the frame of COVID measures, flatten the curve in the beginning. And that's really based on predictive modeling because you can predict that if you lower your R, your curve will flatten. So there's a very clear and, 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 and common example how you can apply predictive modeling uh, to predict what will happen if you tweak a certain parameter in your model. Now, this becomes even more powerful statistics if you go to predictive modeling. Yeah, And this is also when we look nowadays at the different um, mutation of the COVID uh, virus, we can also predict when a certain new uh, 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 mutation will become dominant. So we here see the Omicron and we see if they're uh, gradually catching up with the previous uh, mutation, how quickly they will be the dominant um, uh, mutation in the population. Now, if we go from descriptive to predictive modeling, uh, for the descriptive, we often use mathematical approaches, like I explained in the beginning. But very often, we can know beforehand what kind of model to expect based on our theoretical models or based on neural network uh, approaches. And we can use these a priori predictive models uh, to have even uh, stronger uh, statistical procedures because we have our a priori predictions. Um, so we get to predictive curve fitting. Now, the advantages of raw data, I have shown you that, and maybe you remember this graph, the graph on the left from the beginning of the um, talk. Um, but instead of using a first, a third, um, a second, a third, or fourth order polynomial, we can also plot an exponential growth, which is a far more likely curve to describe this kind of training data. So we can even test if uh, the second order polynomial describes the data better than an exponential association. And we can also use Akaikis information criteria in this uh, case. If you want to uh, know more about uh, uh, involved mathematical models, uh, just drop me an email. 
Uh, and with Archaicus, uh, so the information criteria, you can select a model that is most likely to have generated the data if you use mathematical um, uh, models that are from a different uh, group. Yeah. So differ in the amount of uh, free parameters. Or are not nested. So we can use the F test, sorry. Uh, models that are nested, but don't have the same degrees of freedom. And we use Akakis if the models are not nested and have uh, or and or have the same amount of degrees of freedom. Now we did a very simple experiment using this kind of predictive modeling, studying habituation. Now, what we know is that if you uh, have repeated stimuli, and then remember, I do a lot of beep experiments, so this is really, really uh, boring if you do that in a presentation. But we know that if you present people with, with a continuous series of beep, like beep, 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 they will have higher evoked potentials in the beginning that at the end of the experiment due to habituation. Yeah, and you can also with flashes, etc. So habituation is the most straightforward and basic example of learning. We also see this in, in, in uh, uh, the very rapid uh, saturation of brain responses. However, there's a different phenomenon that is uh, related to habituation that is known as recovery cycle effects. Now, unlike habituation, recovery cycle uh, uh, effects are based on the physiological uh, nature of the tissue. And it is related to the fact that the brain has a, um, um, the capacity of the brain to process a new stimulus depends on some kind of recovery phenomena. Now, this, this seems to make sense, right? In order to give this, this full response on the stimulus, and then again, the brain needs to get back to some kind of baseline level before it can generate the next response. We also see that with neurons. So that's also uh, why the electric signal can only travel in one way uh, along um, an axon of a neuron. It's because there's a closing of the calcium channels uh, causing a recovery, a local recovery cycle phenomenon. Uh, uh, so it cannot travel back along the axon. So in order to generate a full response, the brain needs to be recovered. Now that's not really a learning phenomenon, but a uh, physiological capacity of the involved tissue. And this happens if we have a very rapid presentation rate. For example, at a presentation rate with interstimulus intervals of 300 milliseconds, what we see is that you also get a massive decrease in following responses because uh, the, the, the EEG has not really returned to a baseline. Now, how can we distinguish recovery, so physiological recovery cycle phenomena from a uh, higher order habituation, which is more like learning phenomena? And we did this by testing different stimulation rates in trains of 10 consecutive stimuli. Now, why did we use 10 consecutive stimuli? We did this because we knew if it is recovery cycle phenomena, uh, the effect has to occur already between the first and the second stimulus fully. Whereas if it's a habituation phenomena, this effect should occur more gradually. Yeah, I hope you agree. So these are actually the raw event-related potentials from the group. And what we see here is the reaction to the first stimulus, which is pretty much stable independent of the stimulation rate because it's the first stimulus. But if you look at the second stimulus, then we see actually the effect mostly of recovery cycle phenomena. And that is most striking at very rapid stimulation rates. And if we look at the amplitudes of the last stimulus, then we see actually more the effect of habituation. And that's actually far more modest. Now we can use these predictive modeling to describe both the recovery cycle phenomena 
and the habituation phenomena by using an exponential decay model. Now we had three hypotheses a priori, and that is the change in amplitude between the first and the second tone. Now, if there would be no recovery cycle effects or no habituation, then of course the amplitude would remain stable yeah, from tone one to, to tone two. But if there is a very straightforward uh, habituation effect independent of the, the, the rate of stimulation, we would always see a decrease of the second stimulus. Uh, Independ yeah, independent of the uh, interstimulus interval on the amplitude. But if there is recovery cycle phenomenon, then the decrease in amplitude of the second stimulus should uh, be maximum with the highest or the, the, the shortest interstimulus intervals. So the faster your stimulus rate, the higher the decrease of uh, the amplitude difference between the first and the second tone. Now, because we have these a priori models, we can test them, uh, even one-sided, on observed data. And this is what we did. So we actually had three different components. One exogenous component, an N1 component, a P2 and a P3 component. And if you look at the curves, what we see here is that between the first and the second tone, we see that the early components actually are described by a model that suggests recovery cycle phenomena. So a physiological process. But if we look at the later components here, the P150 and between the second and the 10 tone, then we see that the endogenous components are more determined by habituation or very straightforward learning uh, aspects. And this one is uh, independent of uh, stimulation rate. Now we also followed up on this. So this was just habituation, but we can even look at, at some learning mechanisms. And I'm uh, again looking around if there's any questions now because we're diving pretty deep into the matter. And I think not for the moment. But if you have any questions so far, please uh, let me know or Manda or put them in the chat. Yeah. Now, we took it one step further and really went to some kind of implicit learning task which is, I think, learning is quite vital in, 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 in very basic experimental psychological research. And what we did, we actually developed a learning oddball paradigm and studied the effects uh, based on, on single trial analysis. Now, I'm going to uh, dive first into uh, single trial event-related potentials. Now, the standard way to study event-related potentials is actually to create an average based on a repetition of a certain target stimulus. Because there's a lot of ongoing activity in the EEG, the easiest way to extract uh, a certain uh, cognitive operation is to use the averaging procedure. But this has a certain assumptions. Now, there's two very important assumptions underlying uh, the determination of an event-related potential by means of averaging. And that is the assumption that ERPs are stable, so there's no systematic trial-to-trial -trial variation. And also the assumption that the background EEG consists only of noise, independent of the task. And both assumptions are, strictly speaking, not true. Now, I think this is where it gets funky. And this was actually a huge study that I did in collaboration with uh, uh, a lot of colleagues, uh, but most importantly, Rodrigo Kian Kiruga. He is a neuroscientist from the UK and actually the discovery of the concept cells, also known as the Jennifer Anderson cell. And he has many nature and science publication. So, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, he's really one of the most well-known contemporary neuroscientists. And also Tom Eichle, who is a, uh, a neuroscientist from Norway. 
And we joined forces and Rodrigo Kiamkiroga actually developed a method to study single trial event related potentials. And uh, Tom Eichel and I ran then an experiment that tried to make optimal use of single trial uh, ERP analysis. And we did this actually by combining two of the most well-known ERP paradigms uh, inside. Okay, there are questions from participants on the application of nonlinear outside the neuroscience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could do that. So question to um, uh, apply it outside neuroscience and the software. Yeah, then I'm going to make a fast forward towards a behavioral experiment, if you would like that. But I'm also looking at the moderator. And I have a behavioral experiment where we also use predictive. Ah, Manda. Hi, yes, no questions so far from, from my side, but um, that's, but Debbie got it from probably one of the chats. So yes. No yes. I'm just, just opening the form here. Uh, uh, just uh, can you vote whether to go now to a behavioral experiment? Sure. I know. Yes. It, yeah. Yes. I think I think a lot of the a lot of the participants here might probably be more a little bit more interested about behavioral experiment outside of neuroscience, since oh. not many of us are well versed in neuroscience. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I can't help myself, you know that. But no, I know, I know, <laughs> I'm a neuroscientist myself, so I know. I know. <laughs> I'll get back to the, okay, we go to behavioral experiment. Actually, this is a interactive behavioral experiment, so you can actually join in here. And I just have to enlarge my screen. So I'm prepared. So this is actually quite a nice experiment. I don't know how familiar you are with motor imagery. Motor imagery is uh, a cognitive process where we only are engaged in some uh, um, uh, covert behavior uh, without showing any motor behavior. Yeah, and it is mostly related to um, uh, motor planning. Now I can demonstrate the best. So um, if you just try to vividly imagine that you are swimming. Yeah, I think most people are capable of doing that. If you are very good in this kind of imagery, you just know if you if you move your arms, whatever, even how it feels, what your proprioception is, you know, how, how your, your body moves through the water and what kind of motions you make, especially uh, motor behaviors that you have been doing before. Now, I don't know, but I, uh, my, my guess would be that not many of you uh, are familiar with uh, skiing. Yeah, or ice skating. So if I ask you to do motor imagery of ice skating, now I'm from the Netherlands, we all do ice skating. For me, it's as easy as swimming to even know how it feels to be on ice skates. Now that's motor imagery. Now the fun part about neuro, now I'll come back to neuroimaging. The fun part about neuroimaging is that you can uh, see similar activation in the brain. If you can vividly imagine these motions, as if you would do the real motor behavior yourself. So it activates the same brain centers. Now, why is this important? It is important because we can use this kind of motor imagery in rehabil rehabilitation of people with motor disorders. So for example, if you have a paralysis and if you go to a physiotherapist, it's very tiring to really train and move your arm but you can also train your arm by imagining you're moving your arm. And they have seen actually positive effects of that kind of training. Yeah. So it is a back door to our motor cortex. Now there's also experimental work involved to see are people really using this capacity of motor imagery? So are they vividly imagining that they're moving a part of their body or not? And there's a very simple way of doing that, which is implicit motor imagery. And that is by applying the hand laterality judgment task. If you are in the lab and you present people with a picture of a hand, yeah? And I ask you, is this a left or right hand? This is an easy question, right? It's a left hand. And the way you do it, I mean, you quite see it quite easy, but what most people will do is actually put their own hand 
in imagination in the same position to find the correct answer. Now make it a little bit more difficult. Is this a left or right hand? Right. It's, yeah. Yeah, can you keep your microphone open? It's yeah. right hand. Now, the next one. Left. Now you're moving your head, but probably what you're doing in your head, I don't know if you do it, is actually start to move your hand oh, yeah, in the same plane. Now, this is motor imagery, and we can even uh, prove that you're mo using motor imagery by using a lot of um, repetitions of these stim stimuli in different angles. And what we see then is that if the hands are uh, moved inward, you actually get quite fast reaction times. But if they're moved outward, I mean, this is really difficult to do. You get biomechanical constraints. And even for the imagined movements, your reaction times will increase. It's a very simple demonstration and very easy. And there's something else in the chat. Yeah. Yep. The when the is there any assumption when the appropriate time is to use nonlinearity regression, like specific data, specific specific goal or specific variable? Oh, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I think any kind of 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 um, um, experiment or or um, cognitive operation where you know it is not linear or you can know um, the underlying model. So we know that habituation is always mm -hmm. an exponential decay. There's always a floor effect, yeah? With learning, we know it's always a growth, yeah? Yep. Um, this is another example. Due to the different angles in a 360 degree plane, we know that you can describe this as a sinusoid model. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because the degrees in a circle can actually be described in an X, Y axis as a sinusoid movement. Right. Now this actually gives us, so this is a behavior experiment with a different curve. So if rotation angle does not have an effect on your motor imagery, yeah, you would respond to all these hand stimuli uh, equally fast, then there is no effect of mental uh, imagery or visual imagery, but also no effect of motor imagery. Now, if you would only uh, respond slower to inverted stimuli, you would probably just apply visual imagery to straighten up the stimulus. But if you see an effect of, of medial rotations compared to lateral rotations, then we know you use motor imagery. So we can predict of the sinusoid with which rotation angle, yeah, the uh, maximum amplitude should be in order to prove that you're using motor imagery. Yep. Now we compared left hands and right hands and back view stimuli and palm view, st view stimuli. And now we normally know that, uh, especially palm view stimuli, you really have to use motor imagery to solve the task. And this is actually the H0 hypothesis. Yeah, they're equally fast. Oh. This is what happens if you apply visual or mental imagery to solve the task. Yeah, you have the slowest reaction times towards the most inverted signals, so the highest degrees of um, rotation. And this is actually the hypothesis. If you use motor imagery, you get the highest reaction times on the most awkward rotated hand stimuli. Awkward meaning la the most lateral, right? So you have yeah. to, I, that's I, just out of, out of curiosity, Marie, uh, Dr. Jansma, have you ever done this experiment on um, uh, like uh, brain damaged patients to see like- Yes, the, we have. Cerebral asymmetry, because generally mental rotations and visual visual imagery is more of the, more of the activity of the, or involves 
a larger portion of the right hemisphere than the left. And so I was kind of wondering if that would be, that would be also a factor that would that also be a factor that influences the speed of processing or the, 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 yes, the speed of processing and the, the, the neuronal activity. Just have you, a, have you hacked my talk before I came? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm pure, <laughs> curious because you were so, talking about me, mental rotation and imagery. And I was just talking about this with my students a couple of weeks ago. So that sort of just like popped into my head. <laughs> yeah, we have, we've, we've actually done this in children with unilateral cerebral palsy. Oh, you so have? that yes, we have. We have these data, and we even compared. But I was uh, my supervisor. So for children with unilateral cerebral palsy, they have paralysis of one side of the body, yep. mostly spasticity, actually, mm -hmm. due to uh, damage to one side of the brain very early in life. Yes. Yep. Now. Um, we do a lot of research uh, on children with cerebral palsy uh, because we are collaborating with the Center of Rehabilitation for these children. They mm -hmm. have developed, for example, a uh, uh, forced use uh, interventions mm -hmm. or constraint induced movement therapy, where it's like with if you have a lazy eye, you yes. uh, put a patch on the good eye. My daughter has it. Yes. So, yes. So, I you have to train your bad eye. Yep. I have to train every day. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you can do the same with actually uh, a there child with cerebral palsy. So mm -hmm. the good hand is put in a sling and they have to try to do everything with their affected hands. And strength induced therapy. Yes. As well yes. as pro patients. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They also do it in, in, in CVA patients. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and we have used these patient groups also to do some fundamental research. Now, this is a very nice group because you can do all your experiments uh, within subjects because they serve as their own control. They have an affected hand and a non-affected hand and an affected hemisphere and a non-affected hemisphere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a beautiful model to do uh, fundamental research as well. And there's also a... Uh, um, question or remark in Bahasa Indonesia with a link to a um, uh, oh, that's survey. Just a, yeah, that's just the information for the participants to fill in a survey so they can get the e-certificate. Ah, very good. Don't forget to do that. <laughs> uh, so we did do it on patients. Thank you for that question, Manda. Although I have to say that the overshadowing effect of the capacity of uh, applying motor imagery hmm is more related to the ability to vividly being able to imagine this movement, like the ice skating example. Right. So what we saw was independent of affected hemisphere, these children did not use motor imagery to solve the task for the affected hands, mm. but they did use motor imagery to solve the task for the non-affected hands. Okay. So the and that has to do, yeah. If you, um, that you can only activate motor imagery for automatic behaviors or known behaviors. Mm. So this is also why rehabilitation in adults is easier than in children. Because in adults, they have to relearn certain um, uh, skills. Motor skills. And in children, they have never developed those skills. So they have to learn it from scratch. This right. is also why it's so important to start at an early age with this rehabilitation. Mm. Even in so we even have baby sim now constraint induced movement therapy in babies. Really, and I did some infant studies. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, three times ten minutes a day, and mm. you you present them with toys and you just let them grasp with them and, and reach with for the toys. Hand. Yeah, yeah. The affected hand. And they don't have cerebral palsy, but we know from uh, uh, during birth they had a a oh. uh, accident with. Uh, the, the middle yeah, trauma with the middle cerebral artery hmm. ah, okay. and, and we try to minimize the effects or the expected cerebral palsy to start to appear around the age of two or three hmm. by training them already as infants mm -hmm. um, now okay so this is this is the the first hypothesis if you would use visual imagery you get a predicted phase shift of 90 degrees with a maximum amplitude at 180 degrees. And this is your phase. So you can even predict the value of your parameter settings of your a priori model. So the a priori model is derived from the used stimulus material with rotations, 
which will lead to a sinusoid mathematical model. And the parameters are a priori predicted based on the strategy the participant uses to solve the task, which is either visual imagery and then you predict a phase shift of 90 degrees, or it is motor imagery and then you predict a phase shift of, 100, uh, of 120 degrees or 180 degrees, sorry. Does that make sense? I'm looking at, yeah. People always think that, that, that behavioral experiments are easier than neuroimaging experiments, but I, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Human behavior is so complicated. Okay, again, the summary. So there's no effect of rotation, uh, then the amplitude will pretty much uh, resemble zero of the sinusoid, uh, or we are dealing with visual imagery, and then we see a phase shift of our sinusoid of around 90 degrees, or we have motor imagery, and then we expect a phase shift of around 180 degrees lat uh, lateral. Now, these are actually observed data and data from children, because this was a, a large scale research to see at what age children are capable of activating motor imagery. Now, why did we want to do it? And I come back to this very interesting question of, of Manda about uh, brain uh, injury. We want to see if we can apply motor imagery as a rehabilitation method in children with cerebral palsy. But before you can use this as a rehabilitation, you have to know if children are capable at all to actually engage in motor imagery. So we did this in, in, a, in a lot of school children. So we had a sample of 120 children from primary schools. Uh, from uh, the second grade, so they're around five years old, six years old, and seven years old. And what you see now is that uh, actually the capacity to engage in motor imagery is exactly the same for all the ages, but they only differ in the average speed in responding. So they become quicker at the task, but the underlying, and you see that beautiful, so the underlying. Uh, strategy that they use is completely stable in these three age groups. And it's funny because what you see in the literature is that they only report that they become quicker when they get older, so they become better at the task. But in my opinion, they don't become better at the task, only quicker. Mm. They use the same approach. And that is if you show hands with a back view stimuli, they apply more of a visual imagery strategy and if you present picture of the palm view stimuli, they apply a more motor imagery strategy. And you see here the phase shift at 180 degrees, meaning that there is motor imagery and the phase shift of almost 90 degrees, which suggests visual imagery or combined strategy. So there is an age effect, but it uh, is only with respect to higher efficiency and not a different strategy. And for us, that's a very vital information because that means that in principle, already at a very young age, children are capable of engaging their motor cortex for motor imagery to solve these kind of tasks. Um, this is actually the program that we used, and I'm now looking, uh, so this is actually what I planned at the ending, uh, and um, it's GraphPod Prism, and it allows you to uh, select these different kinds of um, uh, mathematical models, and to use, for example, which parameters you would like to test by means of F-tests for goodness of fit, uh, with the different criteria for either nested or non-nested um, uh, models. So I speed it now towards, so I can now uh, hop back to the center of the talk to go back to these more neuroimaging learning experiments. But this is uh, the way we approach now a lot of different experiments, especially at my group. And I find it very elegant because it uses um, uh, a prediction of your data that you can beforehand already know, yeah? Due to the physiological nature of human behavior. Um, 
And this is why, actually, and this is uh, an approach that's quite common in um, chemical science. And I find it different because uh, different uh, or a bit amazing that we don't use it more in, in, in behavioral sciences because behavior is never linear hmm. or cognitive sciences. Um, and you can even compare. So I know this kind of research from neurotransmitter receptor binding assays. So these are very, I mean, this is in vitro research where you study uh, receptor binding. And there you can uh, uh, use a lot of these, these one and two receptor binding uh, uh, predictions that are also very well-known curves. And we started to use those more behavioral experiments. So, um, this is some neuroimaging. I'm going to the single trial, but there's another one, and that is an explicit learning task. This is a little bit more neuropsychology. Yeah. And I'm going to ask again if there's any questions so far. No. See how I'm doing time-wise. Uh, you've got Good. about five minutes. Five minutes. We've got about five minutes left. But of course, if, oh. there, if there are questions, we'll, we'll... I, I didn't know how much much time I had, so maybe I uh, I no, should skip right. the digits. But I thought it was still eleven o'clock. So uh... <laughs> that's quite all right. So no, no. Okay. <laughs> So the, the, the last experiment that, that might be an nice demonstration because so many people are familiar with it is the digit learning task. Yeah, so with digit learning, normally in the, in the BISC and in the WISE, you, you build it up gradually, you start with, with, with two numbers, then three numbers, et cetera. But you can tweak the digit learning. And we know that um, if you present a series of nine digits, then I think the, this is... Uh, the number of um, uh, Miller is that in our working memory, we can contain on average seven items okay. plus minus two. Yeah. So that is that I, everybody knows this number. Now you can actually play around with that because if I present a series of, of nine numbers, the chance that somebody knows these nine numbers in the correct order the first time are not that large. Yeah. Uh, or 10, actually, I did 10. Uh, because it exceeds the seven plus minus two, but they will definitely have learned the series if I present it six times. And the nice thing about 10 uh, digits is that we have 10 unique digits within the series of zero to nine. Mm. Uh, that's on your keyboard, so that's quite easy. So this is what we did in the experiment. We had experimental trials where we had a random series of the nine digits and repeated that six times. Or we had actually a, a regular series from zero to nine or from one to zero or two to one, etc. So it was an increasing series of all the digits on your keyboard in the control trials. Now you can predict a priori that in the control trials, there's no learning going on. You only have to memorize the first and the last digit and you work your way through that. So the responses are all correct from the beginning. Now, in the experimental trials, we know that there probably is a recency effect that you know the first three, four digits uh, or primacy effects, but also a recency effect where also the last digits is being memorized in the first presentation. And in the end, so you will probably uh, be able to reproduce all the digits and uh, there is gradual learning going on. Now, it gets now really funky because we cannot even predict that with a uh, two-dimensional mathematical model, but we can apply a three-dimensional prediction. Yeah, and uh, the program can be used for that. So what you see here is actually the primacy effect and the recency effect. This is the first presentation of the 10 digits, and this is then the second presentation, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. And this is, for example, the inverse efficiency score. So they become faster and more correct with repetition of the series. And we can even test this 3D 
predicted model on the observed data. So here we have the reaction time data and we see that there's pretty much a perfect fit on uh, the inverse efficiency score yeah, of the experimental trials. And these are the control trials. So there's absolutely no learning going on here. This is the regular series. And we can link that to the observation of the ERP P300. And it's not nearly as nice as the behavioral data, but you see a similar effect that there is learning going on on the experimental trials, but not on the control trials. And this is the, I mean, I like this because it's a very nice explanation how you can use very advanced methodological procedures to unravel a observed behavior and a covert uh, brain behavior that you match with each other. And it looks cool. I mean, I admit it looks yes. cool. And this is why I love science so much, I think. <laughs> and that's that's my time up, Manda. So thank you so much, Dr. Youngsma. That's very interesting. I've been. I, if only we had um, the. So uh, the the software itself is it for for you as an expert? Do you think it's hard to learn? Like, is it hard to to? You no, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is very user friendly. Do you want a demo of the software? I have it on my laptop. Uh, sure, like just a quick demonstration, probably for everyone yeah. here. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I think a lot of a lot of the participants are interested in. In we are familiar with SPSS, but not. I don't think any of us is. Uh, yeah. I think one of us is familiar with the use of nonlinear data analysis, but the rest of us were pretty much blank when it comes to nonlinear okay. data. Oh. Oh, wait, this is not going too well. I thought it was working on this computer. Ah, I can't get my graph bot activated. No, no, that, that's all right. If it, if it doesn't work, yeah. it's all right. Maybe we can set up a later time for you to, I don't know, train us on it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is pretty. So they also have a very nice website. I can put that in the, in the chat probably. Sure. And it has a tutorial, I assume, on the website. So for yes, it has a tutorial. But mm -hmm. I have to say, um, uh, I, I use it always for uh, visualization of my data. Right. So not always uh, for the nonlinear regression analysis. Um, but uh, I like it much better than SPSS when it comes to uh, making yeah. graphs. Right. Yeah. Uh, SPSS is not a particularly nice package for visualize, visualization of data. No, um, some of the some of the um, free um, softwares are better at visualizing, at plotting your data. I think. Yeah. So thank you very much. While you type yeah, in, this, yeah, the, yeah. The, I... Thank you very much for the insightful presentation. Now, um, I'm going to open. Maybe we have about five to ten minutes. Is that okay, my Debbie and Tommy? To 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 open the question and answer form for yeah. tiny. No problem, uh, Amanda. Okay, um, if there are questions, I think um, for those of you who are uncomfortable asking it in English, you may go ahead and ask the question in Indonesian and I'll translate it to Dr. Youngsma. Or, or Dutch. Uh, or, or uh, well, yeah, that's well, that's well, one of my concerns when I was, uh, when, I was um, when I discovered that I was going to, um, moderator uh, become a moderator i was like hmm, if my grandmother was still alive and she found out that i butchered your name in the pronunciation she would have killed me alive she would have killed me because we all have to speak they all speak that we don't but they all did so any questions from the participants i know um so you've already answered some of the ones that's uh, been typed in the chat box um outside the uh, neuroscience will since your research is on mostly neuroscience, so you do use it in conjunction with the, even the behavior, as you mentioned earlier, you, you, you visualize the behavioral um, data and then compare it to the neurophysiological data, the psychophysiological data, just to, to see that there's a close match between, especially with the, with, the digit, with the digit span test, right? There's a close match between what the behavior data, behavioral data shows and what the neuropsychological data shows, right? Yeah. Um, and this is a, a, actually a very good way of demonstrated, uh, demonstrating the added value of neuroimaging research. Mm -hmm. Because there are situations where you don't have behavioral data 
or you are not capable of collecting behavioral data, for example, with paralysis. With paralysis, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, but there are many other examples. Uh, but also because neuroimaging data is less sensitive to noise in a way, because it's more direct and also more refined. Mm -hmm. So you can also use it to unravel all these different uh, steps in information processing between stimulus and response that you cannot capture with only behavioral data. They are the end products of information processing. Mm. So th th there's two ways what the added value for me is for neuroimaging in, in these kind of neuropsychological behavioral experiments. Oh, there's a question from the head of the lab that I'm um, a member of. So Ibu Gurit asked mm. if, um, what do we do if the statistical analysis shows that there's an interaction, but the data is not linear? Plot, plot the data. <laughs> and then, uh, so know what kind of data you're dealing with. So there are certain ways uh, to solve that. Um, and, and it depends on, on uh, the kind of non-linearity you're dealing with. Yeah, but, but, but the first step is always visualize your data because this is where you can recognize the pattern and, and dealing with, for example, a Gaussian would ask for very different solutions than dealing with exponential growth or with a sinusoid or an S-curve. So the, the first go-to solution would be to plot your data and then decide from there what to do next based on, on what the plot shows you. Is that? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that allows the best feedback. Um, besides Prism, yeah, R or MATLAB. You can use R or MATLAB. Then, of course, you have to know how to program mm. your, uh, your models right. that describe your data. But what we see nowadays is that R is, is uh, becoming more and more standardized in use. So, maybe did that answer it, the question? So, R. Yes, thank you. R. Yes. Did that answer your question? So plot? <laughs> the best answer would be to plot and then decide from there what to do um, to test the interaction. Okay. All right. Agnes, oh, here's our, our nonlinear or our psychophysiological experts. She's asking if. Uh, uh, I, that, so this is how your team did um, the, using behavioral neurophysiological uh, data in conjunction yeah. with I, one another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is really the signature of the Donders Institute in Nijmegen. So we have this huge SA Donders Institute for Neuroimaging and Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, and that is, uh, it's, it's an interdisciplinary institute that we invest with, with from three uh, faculties. So the science faculty, uh, the faculty of social science or psychology and the medical department. And the other value is always combining behavioral data with neuroimaging data. I mean, because they're both, they're both only tell half the story. And, 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 and the real strength and the real uh, convincing uh, aspects are in the combination of the two. So observe behavior and together have to know we're imaging with it. So, okay. So the, I think um, what you're trying to say is you do always try to, whenever possible, you try to combine the neurophysiological data with the behavioral data, right? Yeah. Like, uh, oh, there's lots of questions coming in. <laughs> <laughs> They were so silent uh, throughout the presentation and all of a sudden they're popping out. Ah, uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, Agnes, I know she got her PhD with Tom Dijkstra on language, uh, right? She's a neurolinguistics, yes. She's yes, yes, yes. Hi. Yes. Hi, Hi very Marija. much present. We Hi. met before, Marija. <laughs> I, I still remember. We were also discussing that yesterday. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you did work at the computational neuroscience team. So, no, I uh, didn't. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> My oh. brain get, gets hurt whenever I 
I heard the computational neuroscience team presenting their results, but I did longitudinal uh, research on EEG, but it's, um, uh, I did a field trip uh, analysis and also using the, um, the brain, brain analysis um, okay, software. So. Uh, what was the yeah, name? I use mostly brain vision analysis. Brain vision, yeah. that's what yeah. I meant. Yeah, that's uh, basically what I learned. But I've seen that you did um, a lot of large scale uh, data. You, you, you gathered this data. I mean, I've, I've also experienced some uh, researchers asking for my raw data because they would like to test uh, uh, the large scale uh, predictions. But I think um, that's kind of an effort that we haven't done in Indonesia. And that's quite interesting how you, you know, um, work together with diverse uh, researchers in order to gather this data and how you manage this. Maybe next time, right? Yeah, um, that, that very quick answer. Uh, thank you for this question. I think it's really important. And um, we started about 10 years ago, really making an issue in the Netherlands for open access. So we're pretty much obliged to publish everything open access, but that even progressed into open science. So we have now a very straightforward um, data management protocols in the Netherlands, where we have, if we publish a paper, always, especially with neuroimaging data, make them available, but also what we call a fair way. So findable, um, accessible, um, interchangeable and, and um, reproducible or uh, yeah uh, so that they, they should also be well described um, and this this kind of, of, of making your data actually available yeah with the paper associated with it allows other research even to combine it with other data sets and get even more information out of it but yeah, I use a lot of MATLAB in the single trial ERP experiments. Oh, that okay. allows also large data sets to be uh, processed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and this nonlinear analysis, it's more data driven. So it's not really like we sign different um, mathematical higher order um, regressions, for example. Ah, that's quite interesting. I, I stay as close as possible to the raw data. All right. Yeah. Okay. But as because, you said earlier, it allows you to like sort of like explore more based on what you yeah, see in the data, right? So you don't have to be you don't have to be so rigid in terms of sticking with the the hypothesis. hypothesis, the <laughs> hypothesis. Yeah, because it's based on goodness of it. Thank you. Yeah, you're I, welcome. There's there's another question, and I think this is from probably from one of our students is it what is a good way to identify nonlinear data set from research um sh the uh asker is quite limited in his uh, experience in research so yeah. he wants to know when's the good time to identify when when he encounters a nonlinear data yeah uh or, or what a good way is to identify a nonlinear data set plotting Exactly. Cool. I was just gonna say I, I didn't wanna I didn't wanna say it before you, but I saw I I saw you 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 <laughs> really suppressing your impulses there. <laughs> Frontal <laughs> lob is still in working order. I probably yeah. wouldn't have been able to, but <laughs> <laughs> plotting. Yes, both plotting. So as as uh, that the same with your answer with Bugut earlier. So yeah. I think the, the best way to test for interactions when the data is nonlinear. I think that the easiest way to identify nonlinear data is to plot it first and see what the trend is like, right? Is it an asymptotic? Yeah. I, I think that we, we neglect the fact that what we do is really observational research, not only observ uh, the observation of our participants, but also the, the visual observation of our data. Right. And this is where you discover patterns and, and, and especially in pilot experiment. And it, it, it tells you so much of what kind of data you're dealing with. It's even if you do a very simple behavioral experiment, uh, we have done a lot of online testing during the pandemic, like most universities, 
Now we see that there's an increase in people that don't really engage in the task. Now, if you plot the data, you can easily say, for example, if they answer with alternating patterns or whatever. So for me, it's the quickest way to clean up my data. Again, it's plotting outliers. You can, it's so much easier to see that than immediately go black box like to a mathematical approach where you calculate the standard deviations and more than two or three standard deviations is now i mean this is the the very theoretical procedure but mm -hmm. with plotting you just immediately see the red flags where it goes wrong exactly i think we sometimes we sometimes ne neglect that sort of like it's quite important but i think we sometimes focus too much on the numbers without necessarily seeing how the numbers fit into a uh, a plot. I agree, I, and we discovered this the, the the hard way when we tried to teach our um, statistical and research methods class this semester, uh, I, the past yeah. semester, and we're like, hmm, none of us are seeing any any significant and uh, and significant the correlations, and we're like, hmm, maybe we should plot the data and try to discover, try to identify any potential outliers. As soon as the outliers were eliminated, the data. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is this is also because psychologists in general are very cerebral, right? Uh, yes, and yes. They, and they want to go to SPSS and they keep it all very abstract. Now yes. I'm more trained in medical science, mm. and we want you know we want real patients and we want to stick our finger in the in, 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 you know in, in, exploratory, in the, more exploratory, more than exploratory, and 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 really really uh, handling stuff, literally handling stuff. Mm -hmm um and it's a little bit the same so and you can do that with data, data uh, approach them more in a materialistic way by by plotting and visualizing them and and even with the 3d modeling mm -hmm. uh and then you can really you know walk, walk, uh, walk around it and then observe it and, and and have a look at it from different angles and if it remains like abstract concepts that's far more difficult mm. maybe a take-home message they call message. I think everybody who, who joined this, this this lecture is entitled to get like a nice notebook with, with colored pencils so they can grab everything. <laughs> draw, draw. Do some Plot. drawing. Plot. Plot. Um, so I hope that answered Abdul Razak Fatur Rahman Lutan's uh, question. Um, maybe any last question before I close the uh, lecture session? Uh, can I have uh, one last question, please? Of course, of course. Go ahead. Uh, do, did you want to ask directly to Dr. Yongzwa? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Marja. Um, I would like to uh, say my highest appreciation to your presentation, even though I need more time to, you know, digest all the information as I'm quite new on this uh, kind of uh, approach. So I just want to ask you a simple question. So uh, recently I'm doing my simple experiment using the strip task mm -hmm. uh, in uh, our laboratory in UNJ. Uh, so as you may know that the uh, strip task yield to measure the accuracy and, and the uh, response time. times of the, uh, uh, when respondents uh, respond to the uh, congruent and incongruent um, stimulus. However, from my experience that most of the uh, uh, accuracy score is like got a, a very high uh, scores like we have the ceiling effect for this uh, aspect well uh, in the other hand uh, we also have the um, the the response time uh, scores so uh, i'm not sure whether this is a stupid question because i'm a, once again i'm a, I'm a beginner here so uh, do you have any uh, suggestion or experience how to deal with this kind of uh, data uh, in order to make a very, um, you know, proper cognitive model to answer uh, the, the hypothesis, which like, um, which uh, scores that is better for us to, to, you know, to synchronize all the, the scores that, that we got from the stroke. Yeah, I think that's all. Uh, yeah, I did. thank you for the question. I, I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I personally really prefer to uh, use the inverse efficiency score. That was also made in my presentation and the inverse efficiency score makes a combination between your reaction times and your error scores. Mm. Now the problem with error scores is that, and I think this is also quite an interesting uh, uh, difference 
uh, in populations, if you would do this experiment in Nijmegen, you would find much higher accuracies or error scores because there is a different preference and speed accuracy trade-off. I have noticed that, that if you uh, have an experiment where both speed and accuracy is important, there is a higher tendency to capitalize on accuracy here and in Nijmegen on speed. Hmm. So making mistakes somehow is 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 fine. Is fine in the in the Nijmegen population and as is seen as, as as less favorable here than than in Nijmegen. Yes, it's now, differences as well. Yes. So yeah. it's also interesting. So this is why it's interesting also to collaborate with different institutes, so you can also compare different populations. Even in, I think it also has to do with differences in in, in schooling system, like mm -hmm. in primary schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so now the problem with error scores is that they don't have a normal distribution, like you say. They do have uh, flow. So very often, especially in a task that is not very difficult, you have to see that people are just 100% accurate. Very often. And how do you deal then with some mistakes? Uh, because it's, it's not really a, a scaled variable that is normally distributed. Now, with the inverse efficiency score, and I can put it in, what you pretty much do is you have the reaction time and you divide it by the proportion correct, uh, meaning that if you have only 90% correct, your reaction time will be increased. So you get some kind of um, uh, punishment addition to your reaction time. Is inverse uh, efficiency score. Now, the other advantage is, and you can, there's different ways of calculating an inverse efficiency score, but the other advantage is that you end up with one dependent variable instead of two that are very difficult to compare, mm -hmm. namely your reaction times and your proportion yeah. correct. Yes. Now, these uh, inverse efficiency scores, now you can uh, play around with and also do your plotting and your non-linear uh, analysis, your modeling. Hmm. I'm gonna... And they were also in the talk, the inverse efficiency scores. Yeah. I'm going to write that down and, and how's that? Um... Oh, that, 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 that is, I'm very, I feel very lucky to have the questions I got this from you. Perhaps, Thank you so perhaps, much. Perhaps, but you can email Mar uh, Dr. Youngsma as well if you have further questions, if Dr. Youngsma is open to that. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. okay, thank of you course. so much. My pleasure. Thank yeah. you also for asking it during a lecture because now so many people can benefit from this kind of uh, additional information. I'm it's always it best to, to ask questions during a lecture than afterwards, like one to one. Yeah. Okay. So thank you once again, Dr. Youngsman and Manda. Thank you so much. So um, um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, Dr. Youngsma. And I think I think a lot of a lot of uh, attendees have asked a, a lot of good questions, and you've answered them um, um, them in a manner that's to me that's very informative. So thank you so much for for your time today, and thank you so much for your uh, lecture. Um, of course, if you're as I mentioned, if um, you're open to that, I think those of us who still want to know more about uh, nonlinear data analysis could probably contact you via email if that's all right with you. Sure. Um, all right, so I think that's all the time we have. Unfortunately, I think you have to you have a, some other schedule um, prepared already. Yeah. So um, th th with that said, uh, let me formally close uh, today's um, online lecture. Let's once again give a virtual applause to Dr. Marecha Youngsma, Marecha, Marecha Youngsma for her time and her for insight for her insights um, and her knowledge that she shared with us. Thank you very much. So we hope to see you again uh, soon and enjoy yeah. the rest of your stay in Indonesia. I hope to see you soon as well and always feel welcome also at Rabat. Uh, someone saying danke. D danke well. Sampai yeah. bertemu lagi ya. Thank you. Thank all right, you. everyone. That's all the time we Thank have. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Maida. Thank you, Maraicha.